Welcome back to the Clinical Athlete Podcast. If you're not familiar with Clinical Athlete, we're a network of healthcare providers, students, and coaches who specialize in the management of athletes. You can find your nearest Clinical Athlete provider at clinicalathlete.com. We also have a forum where clinicians, students, and coaches network, discuss, and share ideas and resources related to sports med, athlete rehab, and performance. And just a quick note on the forum, we're adding continuing education courses um, on the weekly, we've got Jared's pain, uh, science of pain course in there. I'm trying to get into the habit of saying the science of pain instead of pain science, but it adds an extra word. It's kind of, it's annoying, but pain, his pain science course in the, in the clinical athlete academy, which is in the forum. And then we also just put in Jason Ewer's tendinopathy management course in the forum as well. And both of those have uh, CEU accreditations for various professionals. So check that out in the forum. And also be on the lookout for our upcoming seminar schedule that's being dropped soon. So to join the forum or for potential potential listing on the clinical athlete directory and for all upcoming seminars, webinars, and events, details can be found on the website. The podcast can also be found on our website along with YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. My name is Quinn Hennick. I'm a doctor of physical therapy in Orange County, California at Clinical Athlete Newport. I'm joined by Jared Maynard, who is a clinical athlete, continuing education director and coordinator, and a physiotherapist himself at King Physiotherapy in Foot Clinic in Ontario, Canada. What's up, Jared? Not much, man. It's felt like it's been a bit of a long day, but I'm excited for this conversation. It's and about to get a pick- whole lot longer. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> but I also picked up my guitar for the first time in a long time, and I, yeah, I decided to go back and learn the stuff that I didn't care to learn the first time around, you know, white belt, white belt mentality and all that. Maybe you can make an outro or intro song for us. It's going to be the worst thing. We're going to lose four of our six <laughs> listeners. though. No, it's perfect. We have good turnover because <laughs> on YouTube, everybody comments. They're like, oh, listener number seven here. Ha ha. I'm like, no, that's impossible. We must have lost one. <laughs> but we're also joined by a very special guest, doctor of physical therapy, orthopedic certified specialist and clinical athlete provider, Eric Lagoy. Eric. Thanks so much for being on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. First, uh, first podcast, so only six listeners. I figured it's nice, hey. easy. Yeah, thing. <laughs> it's a, it's a, this is a good one to start with. <laughs> it's great yeah. to have you, dude. So Eric is also one of the OG clinical athlete providers. He's one of the guys that I first hopped on the phone with when we started this thing three and a half years ago, and he currently practices in Cheshire, Connecticut. Did I say it right? You got it. Yeah. At Gaylord <laughs> Physical Therapy, Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Also, he teaches an elective course at Quinnipiac's Doctor of Physical Therapy program called Exercise, Physiology and Prescription for the Physical Therapist, which is awesome. Eric, can you tell our six listeners what's led to your <laughs> current interest in the field? And then also tell us about the elective course you teach. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you sort of the brief background on, on myself before I became a PT. I studied uh, exercise science and strength and conditioning at University of Connecticut. Um, wasn't really sure what I was going to do after graduation with that degree. So I was initially actually leaning more towards strength and conditioning. So I went out and did some internships, one of which was uh, Cressy Sport Performance back in the day. I was OG there too, actually. So that was uh, Cressy Performance back then. And uh, I read a lot of books when I was doing that internship. And when I was there, physical therapists used to come in and work with some of the athletes. And I started just finding myself gravitating more towards the medical side as opposed to the performance side. So that kind of pushed for me to go into PT school, which was also at the University of Connecticut. So I sort of always had that strength and conditioning and exercise science background, um, which back then was a lot less common than it even is now. Um, so that's kind of my background going into PT school. And then after PT school, I started working. And my first job, I had a lot of mentors. It's actually at Gaylord, just in a different location. It was in their North Haven location. I had a lot of mentors, which was part of the reason why I took the job. Some of those mentors have gone on to become faculty professors at various universities. And they would invite me to come in and speak to the students on the topic of exercise because they always felt like they didn't, the students didn't get enough of that. So I'd always would agree to those opportunities when they presented themselves. And I'd always get all this great feedback, like, oh, the students don't get enough of the exercise side of things. We're so happy you could do this. And finally, I kind of just said, what the heck, when are you guys going to do something about this? You know, you keep saying how great this content is and that they don't get enough of it. Maybe we should actually do something about it. And right around that time, Quinnipiac was getting some 
some feedback from their students that they really wanted to do something formal. So they decided to move forward with an exercise elective. And I was on a short list of potential people to hire to teach it because they didn't really have anybody in their current faculty to, to kind of take that on. So once I was hired to teach that elective, um, it was pretty much a blank slate from there. I didn't, which is pros and cons to that. I even came up with the name myself. I, I literally had no idea what to, what to do. So, um, I've taught it now two years in a row. Um, next fall will be my third year teaching it. I'm constantly revamping it and working on it, but, uh, it's been a, probably the most rewarding thing I've done career wise. So that's the spiel on who I am and kind of how I got to where, where I am. Uh, if you want to know more about the elective, <clears throat> again, I sort of created it myself, but I would say that it's not as much strength and conditioning as people probably think it is. It keeps getting called that, but I called it exercise physiology and prescription because I, I wanted to keep it medically related. I, I got the opportunity to teach a strength and conditioning class in undergrad um, for potential PT students. And I, I turned that opportunity down because I, whatever I wanted to teach eventually, I wanted it to be evidence-based. I wanted it to be clinically relevant. Um, it's just that because the students don't have the exposure to it, the first part of the course is kind of like the fundamentals of strength and conditioning. It's basic stuff, um, some of which is even starting to become outdated, but prep lens table, how do you program for hypertrophy, you know, ways to do periodization, um, and then we slowly start to get more into the medical side of things and talk about how pain changes programming and conversations that we might have with patients as opposed to um, clients, that sort of stuff. So that's the general so kind of gist of the of the elective. It, it sounds amazing. Is that a year long course? Is it both semesters? Nope. It's just a, a fall semester. OK. And so you- the way their programs laid out, they have uh, they're in their last semester of classes. So they have my course amongst a couple other courses and they go out on, on clinicals for a couple months and they graduate. Oh, so you've got them at the tail end of the curriculum. Yeah, that's good. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess yeah. how do you feel about that? I actually like it. They're, okay. they've had a little bit of exposure to patients. So they have, you know, they've already had one clinical under their belt. So they have some reference to pull from. Um, it's an elective, so they elect to take my course. So they seem pretty excited to be there and they're getting feedback from the other students the year before. So there, there's no issues with motivation. They're all kind of getting, there's no, has so far there hasn't been any issues with grading or anything like that. So I just got a group of motivated students that are interested in this side of things and don't feel like they're getting enough of it. And they're excited to be there. So it's cool. That's awesome, dude. So yeah, the, the format of this show is, is going to be Q and A, but we want to, we're going to dive into that course even more just because I think it touches on a lot of the things that we need in the field. Um, but we got a bunch of questions for Eric from the clinic athlete community, and we're going to answer as many as we can. Our usual disclaimers, some of the questions we receive are regarding very specific injuries, a few of which are just impossible and un- unsafe to answer via podcast. So we'd highly recommend you head over to, to the website and find a clinical athlete provider or, or just any other healthcare provider that you can, or email us at info at clinical We'll try to point you in the right direction. For other more general injury type questions, we'll always do the best that we can, um, you know, but things like that can't be necessarily specified to specific situations. And then lastly, we always get more questions than we can answer on any one show. So if we didn't get to yours, there's a decent chance we'll get to it on a future episode. All right. We always make our guest go first and uh, we've got a good list of questions. So Eric, take it away. All right. So I'm going to start off with an easy one. Um, this question is from Ravi Patel. Do I shampoo and condition my beard every day? I had a similar question for John Flagg when he was on. So um, I guess this is a trend. So <laughs> I, uh, I actually found over the years that less is more when it comes to beard maintenance. I don't shampoo and condition every day. If you have a beard, you understand that. And if you don't, you probably think it's gross. But I do, unlike John, occasionally indulge in a nice little beard oil, though. So, But uh, that's my beard talk. I'll stop there. <laughs> um Ravi Patel also asked, what barriers did I face when I was starting this course? Did I get any pushback from faculty? That was that was a question that came up a couple times, so I'll get into that a little bit. Um, first, in, for Quinnipiac specifically, I would just commend them for being progressive enough to add something like this. Hopefully, we see a lot more of it. 
I know of other universities that are starting to do similar sort of electives. So it seems to be a positive trend. But um, in general, that university seems to be progressive. And I went to UConn, so they're not even my alma mater. So um, I commend them for listening to their students and recognizing the need to hire somebody outside of their current faculty to teach something like this. And then some kind of like behind the scenes barriers that I ran into when I got the opportunity, I was so focused on creating great content that I probably underestimated how much other crap goes into this, like figuring out how to grade and, uh, you know, having to create quizzes and exams and coming up with questions and grading fairly and creating rubrics and a syllabus. And I was just so focused on like, what am I going to teach? And then two or three weeks into it, one of my students is like, are we still having that quiz next week? I was like, uh, did I say we're having a quiz? <laughs> so that was a weird time consuming thing that you don't think about with that stuff. So I don't know if I'd call that a barrier, but if you're thinking about getting into teaching, it's more than just the teaching part of it. There's a lot of other stuff you have to do. Um, so they hooked me up with a mentor, a professor named Dwayne Scotty. He's actually been a mentor of mine pretty much since the beginning of my PT career. And he just makes sure I'm running everything smoothly and rescheduling exams for missed uh, students for whatever reason and stuff like that. Um, so that's been super helpful. But other pushback, I don't really have any specific pushback. Um, I just have to be careful to not conflict with what is being taught in other courses because I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about this. You've worked with lots of students, but the school's, the school's main objective is for their students to pass their licensure exam, right? And so they, to a degree, have to study for the test. They have to prepare them for that test. And that test is a bit outdated. That's me being kind of kind. Um, so it's great that they have all these electives and all these other sort of things. But if the students aren't passing the test, then they're going to figure out a way to get them to pass that test. Um, so that's the stuff that I teach might be a little bit more current evidence or might be different trends in therapy. So I'd be careful to not step on any toes if somebody's being taught something else in a different course. And then even something I learned in academics, even faculty has their biases. We all have our biases. So if a faculty has been teaching a certain way or they've done a lot of research in a certain area, then I have to be careful to not conflict with that too much. It's not so much that I'm concerned about you know, disagreeing with a faculty member. It's more about I don't want to confuse the students. Um, so that's probably my biggest barrier I sort of run into. That's kind of my my main barrier. I wouldn't call it pushback, but if I didn't handle that correctly, I probably would get some pushback. Um, you guys just, uh, yeah, yeah, to jump in there, that that's pretty awesome, actually. Um, and talking about trying to make sure you're not stepping on anybody's toes or particularly trying to not do that so as to not confuse the students, have you run into situations where you start saying something or you're doing something or Yes, right. You start saying something and then somebody raises a question like, well, in this course, we were taught this, which seems to be counter to what you're saying. And then do you ever have to say, like, you have to navigate that at all or not really? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that happens. I kind of know when that's going to happen, right? Because I know what I'm teaching and I remember when I was in PT school and mm -hmm. not too much has changed um, with the core content. So I can kind of start teaching something and I can see the, the eyebrows starting to raise a little bit. And I struggle answering that because I always start it with, well, my opinion is that X, Y, and Z. And then I correct myself and I say, my current understanding of the body of evidence is this. Um, mm -hmm. And I basically ask them to review the evidence a little bit more on their own and just push for them to ask the questions, like not take what I'm saying as the golden rule, not take what they were told somewhere else as like, that's the way it is, you know, kind of appraise things a little bit more critically than that so what would some yeah. examples of of subjects be that you run into that with uh the biggest one would be core stabilization type stuff for low back pain they're they're definitely still taught you know transverse abdominus activation and multifidi and i have a whole section on what we say words to our patient wise how that matters and some of the literature comparing core stabilization to other types of exercises or core strengthening to other types of exercises in the management of low back pain and are we doing what we say we're doing all that sort of information there um, so that definitely is probably the closest i get to conflicting with what they're being taught in another course but they seem to have a little bit more exposure um 
to that now though like the different schools of thought they're not taught as much as like this is the way you have to do it this is just the way we're we're teaching it in this course you know and then the other professors will say eric will expand on this more if you take the exercise elective another example might be a uh, tendinopathy like they'll learn alfredson's eccentric protocol and then they'll mention briefly that there's something called heavy slow resistance training if you take eric's elective course he'll go over like the variations in each, what they look like programming wise, the pros and cons of each, et cetera, et cetera. So that's super cool that you get yeah. kind of like shout outs from other faculty members. Yeah. Yeah. That's something nice. we've kind of learned after the first year or two that that definitely makes things run smoother. So this yeah. way, what I teach is more of like a building off of what they've already learned as opposed to saying that was wrong and I'm right. For sure. One other thing to, to uh, throw out here before I let you speak, Quinn, um, is John Flagg, uh, who we mentioned in reference to all things beard. He also wanted me to <laughs> to ask whether you've gotten any pushback from students. And maybe we could even add to that question and, and ask, have any students been particularly, I don't know, argumentative or contrary in, in, in your class? Or they all seem to be pretty open-minded, open to what you have to say, and just critical thinkers that way? Um, I think my student selection is biased just because they elect to take my course. So the <laughs> students that probably want to argue with me just took a different course to begin with, maybe. Um, I actually think I try to encourage my students to not just accept what I'm saying and to question what I'm saying more and ask me, you know, nobody's really asking for references. I mean, I provide them, but, you know, like, where are you getting that information from? I have I have a lot of students come up and ask me questions somewhat related, but not always related after class to what I might be teaching. It might be more of like their own programming or a different injury or something that they saw on Instagram. And so they'll ask my opinion on that and it might get away from what I'm teaching. So I try to, but I'll still give them um, some literature on that. So that happens more often and that's more like it might conflict with what they've thought, but I haven't had any what I would consider arguments or anything that was really non-professional or anything like that, really. Everything's been really good with that side of things. But again, I think my my students I work with are a bit biased <laughs> for the most part to, in my same vein, I guess. Eric, you mentioned that sometimes when you're um, trying not to overstep what they're learning in school, but also also trying to redirect a little bit, where you'll catch yourself and say, instead of my opinion, well, this is my current understanding of the of the evidence. Do you th find that having taught this course now for a couple of years, you have gotten more sensitive in regards to how you say things? I'm asking because I, I struggle with this as well. And I think I've been out about five years and I think we're all around the same age and we've all kind of evolved since school and we'll make jokes about what we learn in school, just kind of in passing. And we're all like, ah, ha, ha, ha. We all, we all appreciate what we learn in school and all these things. But I've found that I'll be doing presentations like recently did a, a webcast with a group of PT current DPT students about exercise prescription. And I, I made some joke about transverse abdominus activation and I made it in jest, but it was kind of like, you know, it was one of those things where it was like, poo-pooing on finding the transverse abdominus activation. And then, but as I was saying it, I was like, ah, they're, they're literally probably learning this right now or something like that. I was like, I, I need to be better about that and, and not do those things. Have you found that that has been something that you've learned how to kind of be a little bit wiser with your words, I guess, when talking to yeah, students? Definitely. And I found that what I think is going to happen in the future <clears throat> is that each student class I have is a little bit different, you know? So my first class I had 16. So the way the elective works is they, they run, they, they offer this elective and if two people take it, then it's not enough people. They just cancel it and they cap it at 25 for one for myself. So I can't have an elective with like 50 people in it. They have to kind of spread it out a little bit. So the first year was offered. I had 16 students. And then last year I had the max, I had 24, 25 students, and it's probably going to be similar next year. So it's, it's good, you know, but the 16 students I had, it was, it was a little smaller. So the conversations were a little bit more one-on-one -on -one, and the conversations tend to be a bit more dynamic within lecture. And then this last class was a little quieter. Um, I definitely found myself kind of watching when I say a little bit more, and I don't know if that's because I have more experience now 
or if that's just because the that class was sort of a different unit compared to my class before that. So as I work through the semester, you get a vibe for like what they're feeding off of. And if you're if they get into if they enjoy when you kind of get off on a tangent for a little bit versus if you should just stick to the, the core of what you're teaching. Um, so I, by the, the second half of the semester, I feel like I'm more dynamic than than I am in the first half with stuff like that, you know, because I kind of know how to handle that the personalities in the room, I guess. Do you meet with other faculty members to reconcile any discrepancies in the course content or anything like that? Yeah. So my mentor, uh, Dwayne, he serves as my mentor in terms of like all the logistical side of things, but he also teaches most of their musculoskeletal content. Um, and then the other faculty that teaches musculoskeletal as well, will kind of email back and forth if they make changes. So, uh, as an example, one of the other faculty members, Jay Meyerson, teaches the tendinopathy lectures in one of their musculoskeletal courses. So he sent me the slides, one for feedback, and then two to see if it conflicts with anything that I teach. And then Dwayne would be CC'd on that as well. And he would give us feedback if we're just like going too in depth, you know, and, and like, here's what they would ask on the licensure exam. So make sure you guys remind them that this is what would be on the licensure exam. And this is what current literature kind of says. So it's, it's a lot of like, just communicating and, you know, making sure you're teaching what you want to teach, but also respecting what other people are teaching, but then also making sure that they're going to pass their licensure exam. So, um, it's an interesting process. <laughs> yeah. That's an interesting dynamic. Okay. I'm going to, I'll go ahead and ask another question. Cause I think we can talk about more of this stuff in basically all of the questions that have been asked. So Kevin O'Connor asks, do students today seem to have a greater understanding of strength and conditioning coming into school? And I, I'm assuming that he's asking, do physical therapy stu- or physio students or rehab professional students have a better understanding of S&C principles coming into rehab school or grad school? Um, to answer that question, I don't know. I, I'm not sure because I, th- I think that would assume, you know, it's about their background coming in. I think with physical therapy, and again, I'm just spitballing here, but most of them are coming in with an undergraduate in some type of biology ish thing. Maybe, um, I know we had people across the board, you know, business majors who wanted to change careers, these types of things, but a lot of them were athletic trainers or exercise science majors or something in biology or some type of science. So at least they got something in that realm. As far as strength and conditioning, I'm not sure about that. And I, but having said that, I've been kind of away from student cohorts regularly. So maybe Eric can speak a little bit better about that. Um, but I now do students today have a better awareness of these types of things? It's definitely possible, especially with social media, just having the crazy amount of content in your kind of in your face. It's almost hard if you're going into physical therapy school and you are following you know, these kind of like rehab esque pages and things like that. It's hard to not see exercise in front of your face a lot. Mm -hmm. Does that then change their understanding of strength and conditioning principles? Probably not, but do they have more exposure to that stuff coming in? It's definitely possible, um, with with social media, but then again, there's a selection bias. You know, I'm only following those pages because we're part of that, that, that whole crowd, you know, the majority of physical therapy students, I don't know what they're doing. So, I don't know. What do you guys think about that? Not everybody uh, at once. <laughs> yeah, I would I would say a similar answer. I I mean, the students I work with are a bit biased. Obviously, again, they're, t- they're electing to take my class. So they're electing to take an exercise class over a manual therapy class um, or a pediatrics elective or something along those lines. So there's obviously an interest there if they're electing to take it. Um, that's one of the things I'll ask them on the first day of class. Why did you take this this class? And the answer to actually surprise you, like, would surprise they surprise me. What some of them elect to take it because they're they're active on social media. They they might follow something like clinical athlete. They have an interest in that. And they're not getting it in um, in school, so they took the course. Uh, and then some of them are like, you know, I was on clinical, and I just felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, exercise wise, and I don't even know if I want to do orthopedics. So I thought this would be a good class to help me decide that. 
So it's it's much more, even though they're elected to take my course, I still think it's a bit diverse. Um, so some of them have a strong interest in strength and conditioning. I think that's a little bit different than a strong understanding in strength and conditioning. Because I'll see a lot of people come in and ask me my opinion on like they're they'll show me like their programming that they do for themselves and it's just it's just no like rhyme or reason to it it's all over the place and then they'll ask me questions about like dns or pri but they're skipping so much like the fundamental stuff you know and they they haven't even coached <laughs> you know so i just i don't know again my background i started in conditioning exercise science before pt school so i had coached and programmed before i rehabbed anybody you know and um so I, I feel like the interest in strength and conditioning is a lot more than it was even five or six years ago when I first started. But I don't know if the understanding necessarily better. And I think there's just so much content out there. It's hard for a student on top of their regular course load to be able to like differentiate what's good content, what are the fundamentals that I should work on, stuff like that. So Definitely. Yeah, I agree with what both of you guys said. I mean, I think that the interest in strength and conditioning seems to be at least more noticeable to me now, but I'm also sampling from a heavily biased pool of people. Um, but it's been kind of nifty working with the students that I have just even recently for clinical placements. Um, I've had the, the good fortune of having some students match with me who have a pretty strong background in strength and conditioning. Um, and uh, even a, a pretty good understanding of pain science and or the science of pain. Taking your notes there, Quinn, <laughs> um, which has made things really helpful. And then I don't know. I've I've kind of further biased the process uh, in terms of students who might be matched with me in future because I've kind of asked the people who I think have had really great placements. Like, who who in your class do you think might be interested in in a placement where you focus on on these sorts of things? that you've experienced and then they go and talk to people. And then, so again, definitely a heavily biased sort of thing. Um, but I've also encountered situations where students may not have a, a good understanding. Like you said, Eric, they have, they've heard of these concepts. They've seen things thrown up on social media. Um, but when it comes to things like what's periodization or, um, what are the the fundamentals of strength and conditioning? How do we define volume, intensity, frequency, you know, these sorts of things? It, it's a little bit fuzzier. Um, and then it becomes even more challenging when um, when I, you know, might ask them like, okay, what do you think we should do for this patient? And they're, they're giving the best answer they can. And I might ask them, okay, but why did you choose that exercise? Why did you choose those parameters? And they're like, I, I don't know. Um, and I, I try to feel that out early on. Um, you know, they send an intro letter before we meet each other. And then on day one, I make sure we take some time just to kind of figure out where they've come from, what their background is, what their interests are. And if they're, if they're pretty well versed and they, they seem to have a pretty good grasp on strength and conditioning principles, I'll probably grill them a little bit harder, but just because it's going to be more probably productive and, and even enjoyable for them. If someone's really fresh into it, uh, I'm going to be easing up some and probably not to make it sound condescending, but like holding their hand and kind of guiding them at least through the first few steps. Um, I also think that people are probably, um, probably largely through social media, even potentially beyond the echo chambers that I tend to frequent might, might be cluing into, to the utility of, um, you know, at least having a, a, a very basic understanding of, of strength and conditioning principles. Eric, do you think, what are your thoughts on having it as an elective versus a required course? And barring yeah. the, bar, bar, barring the, um, the exam, the licensure <laughs> exam. So let's say that wasn't a factor because we know that's a yeah. big factor, but just the, just the content and the aim of the course in general. Do you think it, it, the stuff that you teach should be required if somebody is planning on going to the orthopedic or just part of, uh, being entry level, you know, that generalist? Um. Yeah, I think um, I think exercise physiology and prescription should be required. I think strength and conditioning and sports medicine should be an elective. Um, so, which is part of the reason why I don't teach a strength and conditioning elective, because any I think any student, regardless of the setting they work in, can take the principles from my course that I teach and apply it. It might be scaled or progressed or regressed or whatever, so it's appropriate. 
but the, the principles are fundamentally the same. Um, you know, I don't, there's stuff that I don't cover in my course that I would if I had a purely strength and conditioning based course or a more sports medicine based elective. Not everybody wants to get into that or, you know, even people that think they want to do sports medicine in reality it might still be a small percentage of their caseload. So um, I think exercise physiology and prescription, just the fundamentals of what I sort of teach, but really some level of that should be core um, in the curriculums. And then if a student wanted more interest in strength and conditioning specifically for sports medicine or something along those lines, elect to take that over something else that you could take. That would be how I would, I would set it up. Where is your delineation between exercise prescription and sports medicine? That's a, that's a tricky, that's a tricky one. Um, I consider sports medicine more for somebody that's trying to get back to a competitive level of playing a sport, I guess, you know, so exercise prescription can be for your grandmother or your kid or your dad or your brother or somebody that's an athlete or not an athlete or whatever the, the language you use and the prescription and the fundamentals should be there. Um, and then on the other side of it, the sports medicine side, you start to get into a little bit probably stricter tissue physiology as opposed to the science of pain. Um, not that that's not important in that population, obviously it still is, but you're also getting into managing people that might be in season or off season or pre season. Um, so the expectations are a little bit different. The, what they're doing, you know, sprinting, running, jumping, cutting, things like that might not be done with more of your general population. So energy system development, um, stuff like that. I don't get into a lot of that in my course because it's an exercise physiology and prescription course. I'm not going to go over how I program for a field athlete that needs to, you know, work on speed endurance and repeated sprint intervals or something, you know, <clears throat> that would be something I would cover more though in a sports medicine elective. Um, but I mean, topics in my course are on the medical side of things, tendinopathy, osteoporosis, nonspecific low back pain, stuff like that. Um, well, there's only so much you can cover, right? If, and if you've got, different backgrounds and these students across the board, you got to kind of, you got to hit those basics. The reason I was asking is because I think the rebuttal would be that most PT programs do have an exercise prescription class, yeah. but mine did, but I've seen your, I've seen snippets of your course and I've seen uh, like your initial syllabus that you posted on the forum when we were, you were kind of like first starting this thing. Yeah. And I'm, je I was jealous because like, I wanted to take this course yeah. but just looking I at it, it. Yeah. So like what differentiates your exercise prescription course from generally on average, what physical therapy yeah. schools are giving now? Well, I forgot now that you said that they reminded me that I had actually had an exercise course as well <laughs> and I just <laughs> forgot about it. So that shows you the impact that it had on me. Um, <laughs> I think it was probably more stretching related predominantly. Be nice. You know? Yeah. Be nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember for that course is probably is kind of a dick move looking back, but we had an exam where we had to write out like an exercise we would give for somebody with shoulder pain. And I wrote like a six week block that I would do with that person. <laughs> you know, it was like way above and beyond for like no real reason other than like I had the time to do it <laughs> during the quiz or the exam. So, um, so yeah, what differentiates my course? When I first sat down to do this, I said I had a blank slate. So I literally did what you just said. I, I said, well, what do I wish I learned when I was in PT school? You know, or what do I always constantly have to work on with students? That's that's kind of like the the route I took. And then from there, I had to decide like you don't have enough time to teach them everything that you might want to teach them. And I thought it would be better for them to be really good at a few things and then give them feedback on or advice on what to do in the future, as opposed to try to hit like a bunch of different areas and you end up doing a shitty job on like everything, you know? So I kind of took those two pieces when I created the, the course. And there's another question that we'll get to probably in a little bit that will help explain that a little bit more. But um, compared to your typical exercise elective, I think I try to tie the exercises back into 
clinical practice probably a little bit more than just here's a bunch of general exercises. You can just um, cookie cutter it. It's, I try to work on the clinical reasoning side of things. Um, I try to make them understand when you're pushing for physiological adaptation versus when you're working more with the irritability and education and things like that. Um, so I don't think I got any of those in my exercise course that I took um, when I was in school. Well, the question that I think you're referring to is the next one that I was going to bring up here. So I'll read it and then I'll just um, ramble just for a few minutes before I let you um, give your thoughts, Eric. So the question comes from Simon Brossier, who looks like he took your course because he said he loves your course <laughs> as a student. Um, wants to know if there's a topic that you'd hope to start. Let's let's broaden that to topic or topics you'd hope to start incorporating into your curriculum. So at the start of the show, we talked about the the Science of Pain course that we got in the Clinical Athlete <clears throat> Academy that I put together um, with some some big help from some people like Mike Amato, um, just to to go through the literature and figure out what was important to include and how to to make it cohesive, you know, and, and still keep it relatively succinct, especially for a big broad topic like like pain. And, and the same could be said for any of the things that you mentioned, like tendinopathy or osteoporosis or whatever. Um, and then I'm finding just with the nature of of research or science being what it is, given that there are constant additions or or revisions being made to our understanding or the body of literature is constantly being added to all the time. And then if we're, you know, this is, I'm pretty positive we all agree on this. We need to try to stay up as best we can on what is being said so we can form um, our opinion based on, on what the, the literature is saying. Um, I found that with that course, I'm reading some some articles these days and I'm thinking, well, okay, I'm probably going to have to come back and, and update this now um, or say this particular thing a little bit differently. Um, uh, throwing it to uh, Tim Gabbett, who we had on the podcast a while ago. I don't believe we've released that episode yet, but it's forthcoming and he's, uh, <laughs> he's going to do a webinar for us this year. Um, when we were, when he and I were chatting prior to hopping on the podcast, um, he he was saying that given that his area of research with acute to chronic workload ratios and injury prediction uh, or, or injury risk reduction and that sort of thing in athletes is such a, a rapidly developing field, um, it was important to him to be able to come back and you know perhaps update some of the material that might be outdated or add to it or something like that. So you've you've taught this course for a little bit now. So any thoughts on 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 what you do want to add or change or anything like that? Yeah. Um, for Simon, Simon's my guy. So that's probably why I chose this, this question. I'm just a little bit. <laughs> I like him. Um, he's a strong student and he's doing the level up initiative and he listens to the podcast. So, um, that's probably why I, I picked this question. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> sounds, he sounds pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but it is a good question. So, um, and he has firsthand experience with what I, what I taught too. So, um, the I want to get more into the science of pain because it is difficult to teach an exercise elective and not have that be part of it. And I partly shied away from it initially because a few years ago I didn't probably haven't wasn't as well versed on it as I feel like I am now, although I still don't feel like I'm really well enough versed on it, but I'm getting there, you know. And I also felt like that would definitely be an area that could step on toes, right? <laughs> of other faculty and content and, you know, going back to the literature exam and everything. But it gets really challenging to teach an exercise elective and not have that be part of it, you know? So, and if you try to avoid that, you end up teaching a strength and conditioning course, you know? So, um, sometimes I'll teach something and I look at the students and think about their background and what I'm saying. And I'm like, fuck, this is I'm just teaching them like how to squat, <laughs> you know, like, that's cool. Right. We're all like, oh yeah, sure. we know how to squat now. And that fits our biases, but like, <laughs> then they're going to go on clinical and they're just going to try to get everybody to, to squat, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a little bit more to it than that. Right. So sure. uh, there's a whole section um, that I go over on what we say and how it matters and all the research that supports that. And so I kind of dabble it into there. And then we get into low back pain, some of the research, um, showing, you know, what works and 
we're having them reframe why it might work and um, all that sort of stuff. But I still feel like I do a better job on the science of pain stuff. So the general layout of the course is the front end is very general content. It's very strength and conditioning and exercise based. And as we move through the course, it becomes more clinically based and dealing with um, people that are in pain. And I would like to have that section brought up earlier. Um, and that might mean cutting out other areas. So I have to kind of pick and choose my battles, I guess. Um, so that's probably the, the biggest thing. I'd like to cover energy systems. Um, that's just something that interests me a lot and is a weak area, I think, as well. But that content would have to go in the place of something else, you know? So, um, and then that starts to get into more of like the sports medicine side of things too, and to a certain degree, once you get out of like aerobic training and stuff for general population. So those are probably the, the two areas of science of pain. I, I will include more of that. That's definitely going to happen. And then if I have room to squeeze some stuff in on energy systems, or at least get them thinking about that side of things, you know, like more work capacity, um, even chronic workload stuff, more of that side of things. I would like to include that in somewhere. It's just tough to squeeze it all in there, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So. Well, too, it's like there are third years. They're almost done with PT school by the time they're seeing you. And so yeah. then all of a sudden to then have this, if they're not already familiar, this discussion on the complexity of pain at this point, it's like, uh, you know, yeah. you know, it's like pick your battles, but. But like you said, it's just hard because every most 99% of the people that they're going to be seeing walking to their office door are going to be, you know, complaining. They're there because they hurt. They're not there because they want a better squat. They have other people for that or they do other things for that, most likely. Yeah. So do you find that just at least conversations about tolerance and capacity to quote Scott Morrison satisfies <laughs> that to some extent? Yeah, so there's a visual that they're given in a couple other courses, and it's just a zero to 10 pain scale. And they kind of have like a green light, yellow light, red light. And it's just talking about tissue sensitivity or irritability or whatever, however you want to frame that. And, you know, I think the zero to three range kind of gets a green light, and somewhere between four and six might be a yellow, and anything above six is a red. So I'll pull that up a little bit. And if we're talking about, tendinopathies, you know, and I'm talking about more aggressive loading strategies, I might say this is for the people that fall into this color screen scheme, you know, um, or if we're talking about low back pain, um, you know, I'll say if this person was in this bracket and these were their goals, we might do this. Whereas if they were here, I might spend more time doing X, Y, and Z. So I at least try to get them to understand the idea of tissue sensitivity and how that might dictate your exercise prescription more than any one single diagnosis at the very least, you know? Um, but that still isn't quite pain science or science of pain to me. That's just saying like, if they're not as irritable, push a little bit harder. And if they're more irritable, be a little bit more cautious or whatever. So when I talk about wanting to include more science of pain, I'm thinking more like goal setting, um, getting at what their expectations are for therapy. What are their belief structures? How does that influence your exercise prescription? Um, Cause I don't, the, my sort of almost like my biggest fear is that they'll come out of the course and just have this super strong, like strength bias. Right. Uh, and that was kind of like what I felt like I had coming into there, like in the PT, like I, I had this mm -hmm. background that most people didn't have. And I was like, well, I already know literally like my first year, I was like, I already got the exercise stuff down. So I'll just become like a master of manual therapy and then I'm good to go. I'm done, you know? So, and now it's like, what the hell was I thinking? Like, I, first of all, compared to what I know now about exercise prescription, I didn't know anything. I just thought I did. <laughs> I had people doing ridiculous stuff. And then my thoughts on manual therapy have completely had a paradigm shift. So, um, I don't expect them to have all the answers to everything that you might teach, but I don't want them to come out of my course and just think that like strength is always the answer. Um, and that if you just get people stronger, they're going to be fine. Uh, we have to talk about loading. We have to talk about tissue adaptation. Um, we have to talk about certain situations where strength or hypertrophy might be the goal, but it's a lot more than that. And it's, you know, to what you just said, Quinn, most of the people that are coming in are not coming in because they're weak. They're coming in because they're in pain. 
And even the relationship between strength and weakness and pain isn't as clear as they might already think it is, you know? I suppose there's the delineation between like post-op. I don't see a lot of post-op being out of, yeah. you know, out of network. And, and so most of the people that I see are chronic pain. No, still probably high functioning, but um, right. if it was a lot of post-op, then maybe the conversation, you know, you're still talking about pain, but it's almost more accepted by the patient to know that there's going to be some discomfort in the process of post-op rehab rather than chronic you know, up and down, that's less, it's less black and white. The, again, I'm going to, I'll go back to the web thing that I did with those PT students because I literally did it today, like two hours before this. And these exact uh, questions were coming up. So this is really resonating with me. One of the girls asked in cases of tendinopathy, she was like, well, what if somebody's just not getting better? What if somebody, what if they still have a little bit of pain? And I, it made me think, because I had to, I'm in the moment. I'm on the webcam with these people. So I had to, you know, <laughs> delicately, but it made me think that our physical therapy students, is this your sense, Eric, that, that PT students are still kind of with the mindset that we need to cure the people that are walking in the door and exercise is one of those things that can cure their pain. And if they're still having pain, that is a failure. Yeah, I'd say most students would would probably say that that's what they believe. Yeah, because my what. my answer to this to this young lady was, and I had to pull back because we could have talked about this forever. Was was essentially the premise was maybe we need to reframe their goals a little bit and um, yeah. <clears throat> reshape their expectations as to what this process is going to entail. Because I even from a just a straight biological standpoint it, across the board really what I've seen in regards to the tendinopathy literature is they're like, don't even sniff at a plan or a prognosis small, you know, closer than 12 weeks, like 12 right. weeks minimum, just bank on that. Like that's like right. a starting point. You know, we just got to get mm -hmm. the ball rolling. We got to like create 12 weeks of momentum before we even see things. So I, I think that we maybe have this skewed perspective, even as clinicians and, and students too, as to what the process is supposed to entail and then that is definitely spilled into the, the patient because if they don't know it's supposed to take 12 weeks to even see some type of change, maybe then their thought is like, oh, it's been two weeks. I'm still having pain. Yeah, but it's less pain. Yeah, but it's still there. But you yeah. can do so much more, but I still hurt. So it's like it's like that. Right. I don't know what to do about it. I need you to, to, <laughs> to add teach that into. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all part of it, though, right? Yeah, we definitely talk about um, particular just because we're talking about tendinopathy. We definitely talk about, you know, what does a plan of care look like for tendinopathies? And let's say I'm assuming most of them are going to end up in a standard sort of insurance based outpatient clinic. So let's say, let's say you get 12 visits with this person. What's the best use of those 12 visits? You know, if you do the three times a week that your boss wants you to do or whatever, they're done in a month. If you do twice a week, you get six weeks. If you start at twice a week. And you switch them to once a week and then every other week, how long can you stretch that out for? And then what does the literature say about how long this is going to take? And, you know, how much of this, how familiar is the patient with the exercises you're going to give them? What do you think their compliance rate is? Like all these sort of factors that go into the decision making process of creating a plan of care with just as an art, sort of an arbitrary number of visits, I guess, you know, um, and I do that because that's not always how I might do it, although it's pretty similar in my setting, but I know that that's what they're going to be faced with on their clinical rotations, right? So um, if they go on the clinical rotations and they have someone with a tendinopathy in front of them, they're not going to just go, oh, well, I'll just see this person three times a week for the next month and then they'll be all better. They at least are thinking mm -hmm. for that diagnosis, um, maybe a bit more long term than that. Or if they start treating that person and they get better in two to three weeks, they know that the mechanisms for why they got better might not be what they originally thought they were going to be, you know, in terms of like physiological changes in the tendon or something. So I try to, I guess, tie that in there. Um, I also try to talk about pain versus function, I guess, which might be what I would have said to those students, right? If, you know, for some people, function is more important than complete resolution of symptoms, particularly if you're working with athletes. They and function at a high performance level in season with 
three or four out of 10 type tendinopathy pain that, you know, is stable. And that might be the best you're going to get for a little while, you know, and that might be okay um, in certain situations. And so that person, you don't expect them to get 100% pain. Uh, that's not necessarily their goal. Their goal is to be able to have it be stable and reasonable, but still be able to compete at the level they want to compete at, not lose playing time or whatever. So, in, in the last few months, I've been stealing um, a line from Greg Lehman because most of the time on the intake form for my patients, it asks, or sorry, the, the intake form reads, at the end of physiotherapy, what do you expect or hope to achieve? And, and it's not uncommon at all to see like pain-free, this and that, which makes sense. I mean, as we said before on this episode, people are coming in most of the time in pain and pain is unpleasant by its very nature. So it makes sense to not want to be in it. And that's just normal. Um, there's a, an instance just in the last week where uh, at the end of the subjective, I had asked, the, the person who had put that she wanted to be uh, pain-free by the end of physio, like, okay, what are your goals? What would you like to, to do by the end of all this? And she kind of paused and looked at me like, be pain-free. And I said, okay, totally fine goal. We'll definitely shoot for that. Suffice it to say that pain is really weird. It does weird things. It doesn't always behave the way that we would hope that it would. So it's really helpful sometimes if we have other things, other markers or milestones to to use in conjunction with that, particularly objective or like quote unquote functional things that, that mean something to you. So then I asked her, so let's say that we still had some pain in a few weeks time. What would success sort of look like or an intermediate success? What would you need to do to think that you're moving where you want to be? Um, and that kind of for her in that instance, sort of flip the switch, the light bulb came on a little bit and she understood the point that I was making. It doesn't always happen though. And I was having another good conversation over the weekend with one of my best buddies who's also a PT about, you know, what what do we do when when there's a person in front of us who's in pain? And and as as an empath or sympathetic person, you're trying to or you, you want to make them you want to improve their experience or take away some of their pain because you, know, you you supposedly have the ability to do that. And I've just been sort of chewing over the chewing on the idea over the past few months about like I, I don't know how helpful that mentality is, you know, to to view myself as like the fixer. It's like I can do this for you right now because, like we said, we don't necessarily know the mechanisms by which they're feeling better. Which some people I've seen use. I've seen some people use that as an argument for, for doing whatever, just because placebo and because contextual effects and insert other term here. Um, but I, I, I love, uh, what you had said, Quinn, um, in terms of just trying to reframe, mm -hmm. reframe things, you know, and, and affirm pain as being unfortunately, I guess, part of the human, not unfortunately, it's part of being a human, you know, it serves a purpose. It sucks though, especially when it's doing stuff we don't necessarily want it to do, or it's getting in the way of what, what would make us feel normal or make us happy, supposedly that sort of thing. Um, but if we can stop making this thing, this disease that needs curing that, that we supposedly hold the keys to curing and just view it as, as something that we need to manage. Um, but also, maybe try to figure out how we can still have some of it and, and still feel like we're doing what's meaningful to us and what we care about. I think that's probably a better way forward. Yeah. So in my intake at my intake now in the goal setting section, before they come in, it asks them or it states pain. It is, if you are coming in with the experience of pain, it is already understood that the management of this experience is going to be included in the process. Please frame your goals around function. What can't you do right now that you would like to do better, more of, et cetera, that type of thing. So I'm like already kind of skewing them in that direction. Now be that good or bad. Um, I just only have so much th time to talk and to get stuff done in the session, you know? And so I've found the same thing with you, Jared, every, if, if I don't say something like that, it's always be pain-free, be pain-free, do this, do this pain-free. And with my population is, is usually chronic pain, which is very, it's very difficult, you know? So right then and there, I'm trying to, I'm trying to spin that. And as we're having this conversation, Eric, I'm thinking about you, your answer to the question, which is what would you want to add to the curriculum and, and more of the science of pain? And I'm thinking in my head, how far down the rabbit hole is necessary mm -hmm. or even 
warranted. It's like the pendulum swing. And you mentioned, oh, am I just teaching these kids how to squat people? It's like, that's one swing of the pendulum, you know, just straight powerlifting. <laughs> straight. Right, like yeah. if it was me, am I just like, everybody's doing a snatch for some reason and exercise prescription. <laughs> these, yeah. Uh, and, and so, but then the other side of it is, is like, am I just having everybody do cognitive behavioral therapy? Am I having them do, you know, become psychologists is like that, that sweet middle ground. And I think what we've just touched on is if we can get the person acceptant of the process and the pain experience that there's going to be ups and downs and management change is almost contextual on your, how you view your pain experience not necessarily that the pain experience has changed in its intensity, which you're, you're changing how you view it could change its intensity. Um, but that's pain science to me. And so is, you know, graded exposure and, and tissue capacity and, and tolerance too. It's all, it's all part of the same deal. Um, so I'm like just kind of rambling, but it's going to be interesting to see how you inc- incorporate that. Yeah, because like everything we just talked about, like goal setting wise, great, great conversation between the three of us. But if I did this in front of my students, it, first of all, I would probably completely mind fuck them. You know? <laughs> and then second of all, they've already, they probably feel like they've already are pretty good at setting goals, you know, <laughs> like they've learned that somewhere else. And then I'm just going to confuse them. And so uh, you got to, you got to pick your battles a little bit and know when to push and when to pull and the pain stuff I try to sprinkle in throughout the certain lectures that I teach. I have a lecture early on on coaching. Um, and that lecture starts with, you know, we coach organisms and people. And even though we went over all these sets and reps and rest periods and tempos and everything, we're not just machines where you have an input and then an automatic output. Um, so in that lecture, I bring up the biopsychosocial model. They've all heard the word. They, they can't really define it. You know, so we spend a little bit of time working on that. And um, I draw from the strength and conditioning side of things with the coaching lecture because most of it's more about cueing and not over cueing, um, you know, uh, how to like verbal versus uh, visual cues and internal versus external. That's the bulk of what that lecture sort of is. But that's the first time where I can tie in the fact that these are people, these are organisms. It's not as simple as input output or this is this randomized control trial did this. So I'll just do the same thing with that person. Um, so I bring that up there and we kind of define biopsychosocial. And then I say from here on out, everything's under that umbrella. You know, everything that we talk about is under the umbrella of the science of pain or the biopsychosocial model, you know. And then when we start getting more into tendinopathies, it's, it's very, it seems very bio mechanically driven, right? It's tendons and these are the research articles and they're very much in that vein. Um, so I got to remind them again, that it's not as simple as input output um, sort of thing. And then when we get into the low back pain, um, we can really kind of get into some of that stuff because there's a lot of interesting research that really they, they like it. They get interested in that section. You know, you start talking about acute pain and what it responds to and what, you know, is overtraining and, and then persistent pain and imaging and, you know, when I tell them like stabilization exercises might not be stabilizing the spine, it really like, you know, opens some eyes and stuff like that. So, um, but I have to, I kind of save that. <laughs> Can't do that coming out on day one, you know? Um, yeah. When I said today, when I said maybe curing people's pain is not always the end goal curing like i I emphasize the word curing their pain there was a hush that fell over the crowd that was palpable (laughs) and there was a professor in the room and like i don't know i don't know what they're learning and i don't know what they're being taught and it's just it's just going back to what we've talked about um i think this is good though this disconnect like you're gonna have some of this awkwardness yeah. When, when you're when when paradigms shift a little bit, this transition period it's going to be a long time. You know, this is going to be it's going to be a long time to to push some of these old thoughts out. Um, yeah. But this is kind of I think what we're going to deal with as as courses like this become more prevalent. You know, in in different programs, there's going to be some disconnect. Um, and it's going to be a little uncomfortable, but I think that's a good thing. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, yeah. Go I'm going to feel the question right now, if that's cool, because this sort of came up a little bit with what we were talking about, but um, Taylor Flanick asked uh, if I make my students create sample programs and if I can share case studies. I think this will give a little more context to some of the stuff we're talking about. The short answer to that is yes, I have I have them about two thirds of the way through the course. They have to do uh, an assignment and basically I randomize them into one of three or four cases that I, I make up. Um, and so they get a decent amount of objective and subjective information. They have to tell me what they would do with that person on day one, what they would give them for a home exercise program, justify their reasoning, list all exercise parameters. And then I'll give them like an update on that patient in four weeks, eight weeks or 12 weeks or whatever. And they should be able to update if it's even indicated the exercise program and that side of things. And also like sort of why they're prescribing what they're prescribing. So I do have them create sample programs like that, but more for like what we're talking about. On the first day of class, um, I have like an intro uh, presentation I do on what we're gonna be doing for the course. And I put a slide up that has um, four really, really super brief uh, case studies. And I'll kind of read you what they are. So the first one is a 16 year old male. He's a few months post-op ACL reconstruction and the Goal is to get his quad stronger slash hypertrophy of the quad. The second case study is a 38-year-old female with three-month history of Achilles pain while running. Now it's progressing, so it's actually affecting like stairs and walking. The third case is a 50-year-old male whose primary care physician told him he has degenerative disc disease throughout his lumbar spine, referred him to PT for core strengthening and stability. And the fourth case study is a 70-year-old female with osteoporosis referred by her primary care physician for exercises to help with bone density and balance. So all probably cases that we, maybe not you, Quinn, but Jared probably seen those. <laughs> um, all pretty standard cases in most clinics. And I have them write down one or two exercises for each person and list whatever exercises they would do on day one. And the last day of class, we go back to those. I put the same slide up and I say, pull up, you know, what you wrote down on day one and tell me what you think about it. You know, just to kind of reflect on, on where they've come and, it's it's pretty I, I did this the first time last year i didn't do it the first year um but i picked those four case studies because um they kind of hit different areas that i want to hit throughout the class so if at the end of the course they look back on those four cases you know 16 year old post-op acl 30 year old with tendinopathy achilles tendinopathy 50 year old with slow back pain essentially and some of the languages doctor told him and then a seven year old with osteoporosis that needs bone density sort of stuff how to program around those, how they would talk around those um, with those people, how would they would coach those people. It's limited information, but um, and they just kind of reflect back on where they've come over the course of the course, you know. And so that's that's interesting is, you know, day one, it might be like, oh, I'd have them do three by 10 straight leg raises and TKEs for the three month post-op ACL. And then they're like, I'd have them do like this tempo and the rest periods would be like this. And for quad strength, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of cool to see some of the, some of the progress. So, um, so yeah, I think that kind of ties into some of what we were talking about before in terms of like, how do I pick what I talk about? And I always have those four case studies in the back of my mind and are they getting better at at least treating those four? Cause that could be maybe half of like a regular caseload in most standard clinics. So that's kind of like how I pick my battles, I guess. Do you have practicals where they come in? You know how we had in, in PT school, like you have to go in yes. and like treat somebody. We don't have practicals per se. We have uh, lab days, which I'll call coaching clinics, where we go into a local uh, gym and we basically practice what we preach. To put it. So we have one, um, I think it's probably around week four. So we spent two weeks covering basic strength and conditioning and exercise physiology concepts. Then we talk about coaching and then we go into the um, a gym, a local gym with some strength coaches that I work with. Um, and they're nice enough to let me use their space for a little while. And we actually do it. And I have them practice, you know, stuff like RPE and, you know, single leg variations. And what if this was too easy? What was this too hard? And that that's really when the class starts to take off because they, they're finally out of the that's like why I think they take the class, you know, it's for that stuff. But they can't get there until they you know, learn the other stuff. And then a couple of weeks later, we go back. I think it's after I teach about tendinopathy. So we play around with 
sort of the progression with like tempo work to more ballistic or repetitive type exercises like skipping drills or something like that. Um, so we'll practice that on the other day that's in the coaching clinic. I wish I could do more of that stuff. It was really important to me to include some level of like a lab component to it, right? Because they'll start to do weird stuff. Well, they'll they'll program. You can see my bias coming through, but they'll prescribe like a clamshell, like an RPE, like nine, you know, <laughs> it just it doesn't make any sense. So like, oh, I'd have them do three sets of six at 85% of their max <laughs> clamshell. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't work like that. With the clamshell. I don't know. That, that black <laughs> TheraBand is pretty thick. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> really double down on the TheraBand. <laughs> So, uh, so when they go in the clinic and I mean, and when they go into the gym and they start practicing that stuff, it, it definitely like gives them a reference point for, you know, most of them it's the first time maybe trying RPE or some sort of marker for intensity or, you know, and they can kind of feel the difference between, I don't know, like a goblet squat or squat to a box or something like that, whatever the variations might be or play around with. But yeah, I try to keep it lighthearted though. I don't want it to be like a practical where they stress, you know? So. Well, and again, some of these students may not have really had any personal experience with these exercises either, let alone program them. Yeah. yeah. That kind of touches on one, one question that we had, um, Keegan Barrett, what role does power development play in general population PT regimens? It's a good question. And I'll probably talk for like 30 seconds and then ask, just ask Eric if he, how, how far into the rabbit hole of power development <laughs> do you go with your course? But you know, I think the key here is general population, because if we have, you know, high level or high-ish level ACL uh, rehab or somebody that just wants to get back to sport, um, power is simply just like rate of force development or or plyometric type movements. You're going to want to be doing those things in clinic. You know, there's there's measures for that type of thing, especially ACL. I mean, you're going to be doing hop testing and and potentially some rate of force testing, um, different limb symmetry indexes. So that stuff is probably going to be in there as far as general population, I'd probably make the argument that if you just got them like the ceiling for them to gain strength or, or tissue tolerance with just strength training would potentially give them the risk reduction capacity that you're going to get them versus jumping to some type of plyometric movement for the general population if their goal if their goals goal activities are not going to require that type of thing i guess maybe the rebuttal will be like well what about a fall what do you guys think yeah um i agree with most of what you're saying um in the context of what i teach we, we kind of get into this a little bit in geriatrics when we talk about fall risk and stuff like that. Um, the reason why I like this question is because it just, it shows thinking a little bit beyond just strength gains, I guess, because power obviously has a rate of force development or a speed component to it. And force is mass times acceleration. And I think therapists are, we know that we can increase mass, we can add more weight to something or make it harder or we jump to a newer, fancier exercise or something like that. We forget about the the power side of it. This, you know, and I'm not talking plyometrics. I'm just talking about the concepts of playing around with speed, essentially, or velocity in some capacity. So, um, you know, I think there was an article that came out a couple of years ago looking at fall risks, and it was loss of max strength and decline of rate of force development and atrophy of type two muscle fibers. I think it was weighing at all or something, maybe 2016, 2017. So um, my question would be, is you, someone's programming, if they're trying to reduce fall risk, reflective of those things that have been found to be associated with falls. So improving max strength should have an improvement on rate of force development because you can produce more force. But if you could do a few things that have a velocity component to it too, that seems like it might be potentially more beneficial. And there was another study that I referenced in my geriatric lecture where they had, they took older women um, they had them do three sets of eight with a leg press and a knee extension machine for uh, probably two or three months, I think, maybe like 12 week program. Um, the only difference between the two groups was one group did a tempo that was like two, one, two. So two second eccentric, one second pause, two second contract, concentric. The other group did a two second eccentric, a one second pause. And then their concentric was to go as fast as they 
possibly could with the concentric. So that's it, just a cue really. I want you to go down controlled, pause for a second, and then come up as quick as you can, or go up and down controlled. And the group that um, had the as fast as you can group, they both had improvements in strength, but that group had a greater improvement in rate of force development with those specific exercises, knee extension and, and um, leg press. So I don't think that power training always in this population for what we're talking about doesn't always have to be plyometrics and super fancy jumping type drills. It can just be a simple cue. Like I want you to try to do this part as fast as you can safely. So um, at least in that way, you're getting somewhat into more of a velocity component to it. And I, I've seen Doug's videos of his, of his dad, right? So, yeah. Um, and I've used actually, I, I use some of those in, in my lecture. I asked him if it was okay if I put a couple of those on there, because I just think it's a unique way of looking at training. And before I put the videos up, I'll just ask, do you think it's safe to do power training in, in this population? And everybody kind of was like, oh, I don't, I don't think that would probably be a good idea. And then we get into fall risks and some of those videos. And, you know, do you think it's safe for this person? Why would it be safe for this person and not somebody else? And that starts to get into training history and maybe a little bit of genetics or whatever and other um, factors that contribute into it. But then we start thinking about, well, what if you're just doing a regular old, you know, knee extension or leg press or squat and you just have them do the concentric as fast as they can? Or something I'll do a lot is I'll just do like, some maximal AMRAPs within a small period of time. So I want you just as many reps as you can in 20 seconds. Um, that has a speed component to it, right? So rather than do eight repetitions and the person self-selects how fast they want to move, do as many as you can in 20 seconds. And that also gives them a goal to beat. You just did eight reps. I want you to rest 90 seconds and then see if you can beat eight reps in the same 20 second period. So that's kind of how the closest I guess I would get to power training within general populations or specifically geriatrics. But I do that a lot and I don't have to reinvent the wheel. We go from regular sit to stands to maybe a deeper sit to stand to maybe a goblet squat to now I want you to do as many as you can with that in 20 seconds, you know? So, um, thoughts. <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm not going to add anything particularly new. You guys have both said the things that I wanted to, um, Eric, what you just summarized there is, is pretty characteristic of, of what I, can call to mind in terms of how I often incorporate power training. And, and there, there's some athletes who, um, you know, require more than that. And we, we get into some other things, including plyometrics, but for, for most people, especially when it comes to the geriatric population <clears throat> or just anybody who comes in and, and tells me that they, I don't know, they've had some slips and falls or their balance doesn't seem great. And I'll tell them, okay, um, well, here's what I think we should do about this. I think we want to get you stronger in general. It's probably going to be helpful for this reason, this reason. And we also want to make sure that we, or that you can produce this force fast enough. And I might frame it in terms of, you know, let's say you're walking through your house or you're walking down the street and you don't see, you know, a little patch of ice or a little pebble or pothole and you just have to react and you have to be able to react fast enough to beat gravity and whatever other forces are acting on you. And most of the time people seem to follow along with that. Um, example, and then it, it seems to justify better to them why I might have them do these fairly simplistic things, but focus on doing it, you know, faster and making sure they've got control as they do it. And I don't really, again, for most most people in the general population, I don't really take it much further than that. But I always I try to check every now and then with my own reasoning, you know, <clears throat> what what does this person really need to be able to do by the time that that we part ways. And if it's making sure that they feel confident, um, as they're, you know, navigating their house or their street, then that's probably where I'm keeping them. Uh, if there's, if there are more demands, then of course I try to address those too, but yeah, that's, that's where my head's at. Eric, do you find that stuff like that is one of the big changes that you'll see in the before and after of those case studies? Maybe, maybe especially with like the osteoporosis, Case yeah. and like the you know degenerative disc and all these things where you'll see the students program from them in a very delicate, fragilistic way, and then they'll learn yeah. things from you okay. and then they're yeah they yeah. feel safer with that stuff. You have to reel them back in the other way. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Snatches, <laughs> kind of box jumps, jumps. Right. Like completely. Yeah. <laughs> well, have them have her squat. I'm just like, well, <laughs> but uh, the the case studies are almost they're they're generally they have a set and they have a rep and they have an exercise. And there's there's um if I were to say what if that was too easy they probably would come up with a new exercise. 
Um, so one of the other things we'll do is as an exercise in the class, we'll write step up on the board and I'll say, you know, tell me all the ways you can make this harder and then all the ways you can make this easier. That's all right. Step up. So I don't have anything written down. You know, maybe I'll write like sets and reps. So we could do a bigger step. We could go faster. We could go slower. You know, we could hold weights while we do it. We could all the variations that you can think of before you move on to a different exercise, you know? And so those are the sort of things I try to do to get them to critically think about like the other stuff besides just the exercise, I guess, you know? And then when you start to tie that in with also thinking about what you're saying to the person from a coaching standpoint, a cueing, um, but then also from the science of pain standpoint, it, it really starts to kind of come full circle. But it's like right at the end, <laughs> you know, of the course when it really kind of starts to come together, I think. But yeah, definitely more of the anti-fragile model. I don't know if it's because they're scared to push people. I just think they don't have any reference, you know, for anything other than that. Because if they've gone on clinical, say, what would you do for this person? Like, you know, three sets of 10 with straight leg raise. Like, yeah, I know. Bridges, straight leg raise. I like hip abduction, clam cells. I know. <laughs> but what else do you think of, you know, like besides that stuff? And they're like, oh, those are all the you know, the ones that I thought of. So, yeah. And then, you know, TKEs and step ups and like all like the wall sits, like all like the very stereotypical like stuff that you would see in any kind of clinic. But what other ways can you progress or regress those exercises, you know, do those exercises, do what you think they're doing, that sort of clinical reasoning, I guess. Well, and if you've got a, a regression or a progression in your back pocket at all times, you can, you can at least get through that, yeah. that session. Yeah. You know, right. I love what you said where you have them like, how can I, how name all the ways you can make this harder. I love that. Yeah. Cause they won't, they'll always have an option. They'll never right. just blank, exactly. you know? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jared. No, I was going to ask if we had enough gas in the tank for one more question. I got all that. Listen, I'm on West Coast time, so. I know. Dude. I know. You son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're good for it, Eric? Yep. Sweet. Um, so we're kicking it back to, to Taylor. So I might alter her question a little bit um, to bring it back to your course, Eric, but she wants to know how do you start, usually start programming for athletes, depending on the training history, maybe my addition or, or spin on that could be, how do you approach the topic of programming for your students in the course and, and how to approach that for the people that they might be encountering, maybe athletes or non-athletes? Yeah. Um, threw me a curveball there. <laughs> Got so, uh, yeah. Yeah. The programming, this is something that I might change in the future because right now I teach periodization in the standard kind of gas, cilia, general adaptation syndrome type of format. And I know that that is becoming a bit outdated and there's some other maybe models that might be better, but I think it's difficult to appreciate um, some of the other content that's out there without kind of knowing that stuff first. So when we talk about program design, um, that's where I'll start. And one of the required reading is one of Scott Morrison's uh, articles, actually, when we mentioned him before, where he talks about strength and conditioning and rehab. And he gets into block periodization, all these other types of program designs. But at the very least, it gets them thinking about applying stress um, to create some sort of change to occur within the body and then for homeostasis to be returned. Um, it's very much physiologically driven, but that's how the first part of the course is anyways. So that's what I've been doing with that. And then it gets them thinking about applying stress to tissue and very much mechanotransduction driven and tissue capacity and stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's the most general answer I can give for how we approach program design. Um, I do linear and nonlinear programming too, as an example. So we kind of go over in the rehab setting, when might you use each and what are the pros and cons with each. So linear programming is very easy to lay out. It's easy to create, you know, home programs and educate people on that. But nonlinear allows for a bit more fluctuation um, based on how somebody might be feeling or something like that, you know? So we kind of go over some stuff like that, but I don't expect them to, to be able to master that or write out like some macro cycle or I don't, I don't expect that that's not, really what I'm trying to do with that. But the concept of at least 
understanding um, that there are that these variables systematically change throughout a plan of care. And a lot of it goes back to volume versus intensity. So we'll, I'll give them examples they're already familiar with. If someone has post-op, you'd have them do some stretching or something or passive range of motion a couple of times a day. The intensity is very, very low and the volume is very, very high, right? You're doing it multiple times a day or possibly every few hours. Um, and then as you progress through the rehab and they start to get into more of a strengthening phase, the intensity is is going to be more challenging and the volume is going to be a lot lower so they can at least see how the two intertwine and fluctuate with each other. Um, and then that also ties into the sensitivity model too, right? If someone's a lower sensitivity on that spectrum and you're pushing more for physiological adaptations, this is how you look at volume and intensity. And if they're higher sensitivity and you're looking more to maybe you're not pushing for physiological adaptations, you're just trying to get them out of pain through some other mechanism, the volume might be a little bit higher, but the intensity is going to be a lot lower. So that's a general overview of how we approach program design. Um, you know, and then specifically for uh, the question, that's a big question. <laughs> you know, this makes me think of some of the stuff when we've been talking about with acute chronic and everything like that. So, um, if I wanted to get more into specifics with like an athlete or even a non-athlete, I'm going to look at patient goals or an athlete. What are the competitive goals? What are the goals that are required for their sport? Then how much time do I have to get to their goals, training history, um, general training history, and then recent training history, injury history, stuff like that. <clears throat> yeah. It sounds awesome to me. <laughs> I think they should make it a year long course. They easily could. <laughs> But, you know, it's a step so far. So, yeah. Or maybe, right. you know, I was thinking about we've talked about how it's like at the end of the curriculum. Maybe there could be two semesters, but one in the beginning and somewhere sometime yeah. in the first year, you know. Yeah. And then you've got a whole semester to kind of like if you could do you know, like a first half of your course where you're just giving the basics or maybe that's when you incorporate pain, you know, right in that first one. Right. And you've got a longer time. And yeah, who knows? You start start lobbying for that, man. <laughs> well, they're, the curriculums are the the reason why it works with the electives for these universities is because the the curriculums are already oversaturated, so it's a lot easier to add an elective yeah. than it is to figure something else out somewhere. That's you know, the else. thing though, I feel like I know that you know you're we're under the restrictions of our our regulations in the states, Jared. We have these entities that oversee us. I don't know how they do it in in Canada, but <laughs> okay, I'm sure it's yeah, similar. We, 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 we no we regulations, have all regulations too. We're not but, that far behind. But like I've heard, you know, at CSM, um, I've I've heard CAPTI representatives say, well, you know, the everything in the curriculum is is needs to be in there because that you know we're preparing them for the boards and these are the things. But still, like you know, ultrasound. I know for a fact because I've talked to program directors that therapeutic ultrasound is required still to be in the curriculum and if you're a physical therapy program you don't have that in the curriculum capi docks you so there is room for for more stuff i don't know how much more and i don't have right. any solutions but i just like to bitch and complain about it <clears throat> it's what a platform what to do it on yeah, yeah. <laughs> podcast dude eric this has been awesome man well, um yeah i learned a ton just talking with you where can people find out more about you and what you're doing. Where can they connect? Um, I don't even know. My Instagram is E-M Lagoy, L-A-G-O-Y D-P-T. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I it's mostly pictures of me working out or my kid and eating food and stuff. But I try to put some some clinically relevant content on there too. Um, I try to stay active on the clinical athlete forums. Um, I recommend that students that are interested in this stuff, hands down, should, should do that really knocked it out of the park with this as a resource for for all clinicians but specifically students if they're questioning some of what their professors are learning or just want to um hang out and talk shop with like-minded clinicians um it's just nice to have a place to do that because i i feel like i didn't have that um to kind of bring it full circle coin saying i'm an og clinical athlete provider when you came up with this concept i was like dude i think it's just me and you out there <laughs> Like I didn't, I didn't know if there was a whole um, group of people that would be able to do this, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> it's so crazy, it's, it's right? Really, yeah. 
really cool to see like all these like-minded people because you not work next to someone or sit next to someone in class that is thinking the way you are but to know that you know there are people out there that that are have the similar background or similar interest is is really cool so try to stay active on that and um yeah if you're in connecticut you can swing by the clinic if you're a student and you're interested in shadowing the the clinic we take shadows pretty often so or if you're not in connecticut but you want to come down um check out where I work and chat on me and pick my brain. I try to take students as much as I can. So cool. And yeah, I was going to say, even before you said that, Eric, that your contributions to the forum have been invaluable the past three and a half years. And, um, it's, it's awesome for us to be able to connect with guys like you and then to watch you then develop this program. It's like, you're, you say, you, you know, we were the only two out there, you know, Jared, we'll make three, but now you're, <laughs> Now you're breeding this, you're doing it, you know, you're yeah. it's in there and, and it's just, you're, you're just feeding it forward, man. It's really, really cool. So, uh, thank you for that. And thank you for being on the show. And yeah. I think of any, you know, any show, maybe we gain a listener. I think we gain a listener and then we drop one off. So we, I think we're probably at seven, right? This very second, okay. we'll be at six, like <laughs> tomorrow morning. All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks guys. Thanks Eric. Thank you. Thanks guys.